brothers and sisters in the Dharma. If you are not a fan of Achan Brahm yet, let me introduce him to you. It's a grand opening. <laughs> Achan Brahmabamso was born in London in 1951. He regarded himself a Buddhist at the age of 17. But his interest in Buddhism and meditation flourished while he was studying theoretical physics at Cambridge University, United Kingdom. After completing his degree and teaching for a year, he then travelled to Thailand to become a monk. He was ordained in Bangkok at the age of 23 by the abbot of Wat Thakkar. He subsequently spent nine years studying and training in the forest meditation tradition under the late Venerable Achan Cha. In 1983, he was asked to assist in the establishment of a forest monastery near Western Australia. Achan Bamabamso is now currently the abbot of Bodhiyana Monastery in Serpentine, Perth. And he's also the spiritual director of the Buddhist Society of Western Australia. He's at the moment now teaching and guiding 17 monks and anagarikas. Achan Brahmabamso is an outstanding monk, teacher and also a public speaker. And I think we all know him as the monk who tells jokes in funerals. He is able to make the Buddha's teachings very easy to understand, inspiring and even entertaining. So now let us get ready for a very entertaining evening with our Achan Dhamma Bamsu. We would like to invite him to be on the stage. Can you all please rise? Now the talk this evening is about enriching your life. Everybody wants to be rich. Why do you want to be rich? Because we think that richness can buy us happiness. In fact, there's many meanings to being rich. You can have rich in money, but isn't it more important to be rich in time? Rich in happiness? Rich in friends? Sometimes we need to know what's really important in life when we know, want to know what richness is. So this evening I'm going to be talking about becoming enriched in many different levels, many different ways. Because one of the reasons why Buddhism is growing in the West, the fastest growing religion in so many countries, I was being asked this on the way here, is because the practices of Buddhism, if it's chanting, or keeping precepts, or meditating, or the wisdom teachings, they actually help people become better people, happier people, richer in those human qualities of kindness, generosity, charity, forgiveness, all those wonderful qualities which make our life rich. And because that Buddhism can actually give the goods, produce the goods, that's why it's becoming very popular in, the, in our world. There's many stories of actually people who, when they come across Buddhism, they actually change and become better people. I was telling some people this afternoon that one of our, our members uh, quite a devoted member now. He he was a Sri Lankan man who we call in Australia Waisak Buddhists. We call them Waisak Buddhists because that's the only time they come to the temple on Waisak once a year. <laughs> but he'd always come to our temple on Waisak every year. But he started coming regularly. When I asked him why, this was his story. He said he worked for the Department of Minerals and Energy in Perth. He was an engineer and his boss was an Australian man who was so harsh and unforgiving. He would demand so much work from this Sri Lankan engineer, much more than anybody can do. And when he tried really hard to do that work, he had always been criticised, never thanked for his extra effort. He was what's called the boss from hell. And I think many of you might know a boss from hell. <laughs> and anyway, he noticed that his boss, in the space of only six months, 
change from being a boss from hell to being a boss from heaven. This boss changed to being so nice, so calm, so understanding, that when he gave him work, he asked, can you do this, is it too much? He was always praising this man for extra effort and extra work. Because he was such a nice boss, actually this Sri Lankan wanted to work harder for him. But this Sri Lankan man couldn't help but ask him, his boss, how come you changed, if you don't mind me saying, you used to be a terrible boss before, but now you're very nice. What have you been doing? And this Australian man said, I found this wonderful temple in Perth. This wonderful Buddhist temple which teaches meditation and wisdom teachings. He said, hang on, that's my temple. <laughs> and when he saw what happens when you listen to good teachings, when you practice good teachings, how it helps you in your life, then he started coming regularly. He comes every week now and hangs out there to look after the monks because he sees that the practice that she does enrich your life. Even another story just to indicate how he reaches your life. There's one of our, <coughs> our members, they always wanted to do one of these meditation retreats, which you have in Malaysia and KL as well. He always wanted to do the meditation retreat, which they held in Perth on the weekends. But his wife said, no darling, you can't go on the weekend meditation retreat. That's the time when we do our shopping. You've got all your odd jobs to do in the house. We've got to take the children to school. We've got to do so many things. You've got to do the gardening. It's too busy on the weekend. No, you can't go. So he said, okay dear, I won't go. So the next time there was a retreat, he asked again, can I go on the retreat, dear? He said, no, you can't go. It's too busy on the weekend. But he kept on asking. Because he was so persistent, one retreat came up, he said, dear, can I go on a meditation retreat? And she got so upset, she said, Okay, you go on that retreat. You leave me with all the children, with the shopping, with the odd jobs, with the gardening, with taking them here, saying, you go. So he went. <laughs> <laughs> she was so upset that he went. But after two days of meditation, of learning Dharma, practicing Dharma, when he came back after that retreat, he was such a nice husband. He was so soft and you know, compliant, bendable. He was, so, <laughs> he was so nice that she was really impressed. She was so impressed that when it came time for the next re weekend retreat, he didn't even need to ask. She gave him the money and sent him off. <laughs> and that's a true story. Because these practices actually help you to become a better human being, a happier human being, a richer human being. For example, we started off by teaching you or giving you the five precepts, but so many people, they might take those five precepts but not understand why you should be keeping them. I've been telling the story many years ago when I was teaching a meditation retreat which was next to a church in Perth. And on the Sunday morning, while I was waiting for someone to come into the interview, I looked through the window and saw these two Australian men who'd just been into church, and one said to the other as they were parting, Be good. And the other man said, No, that's no fun. <laughs> and isn't it strange that people in the world think to have fun you have to be bad. To have fun you have to do naughty things. To have, be, have fun, you have to break all the rules. And a lot of times people don't understand that if you want to have a good time, what should you do? Be good. If you're a good person, you have a good time. And this is, I'm going to teach you now about the meaning of the five precepts. Many years ago, there were two monks in Thailand they were going to a dana in a person's house. This is where people offer food to the monks and make them fat. <laughs> people give us so much food. I try to go on a diet but I can't do it. Because I go to people's house, they offer me soap and they want me to eat it all as well. My goodness, it's hard to eat. And that's why I don't own my stomach anymore. 
I give my stomach to you. You can put whatever you want into it. I've given up. <laughs> Call letting go. You know one of the troubles why monks are so fat? Because they don't worry enough. Because when you worry a lot, you get thin, you know, you get very skinny. Because we don't worry very much, that's why we get fat. <laughs> but anyway, they were going to this monk, this person's house, the Dharma, and they were waiting for things to get ready. And they were waiting in the room there. And in this house, they had an aquarium, you know, where you keep fish. And one monk turned around to the other and said, this isn't compassionate. This is a Buddhist. This is a right to keep fish in an aquarium, in a tank. It's like putting the fish in a prison, isn't it? It's putting them in jail. They can't swim wherever they want to go. They said, this isn't fair. What have the fish done to be put in this small cage for the rest of their life? Even in our society, if we put someone in jail, it's only for a few years and then we let them loose, but not for fish in the chariot. Fish in the aquarium is a life sentence. And the other monk, who happened to be a very wise monk, said, you don't understand. It's much better being a fish in a tank than being a fish who's free to swim in the rivers and the lakes of the world. I'll tell you why. Because a fish in a tank, in an aquarium, is free from so many dangers and difficulties. Think, have you ever seen a fisherman dropping a line in somebody's fish tank in their house? <laughs> I've never seen it, I don't think they can do that. So that's the first thing, the fish in the tank are free from the danger of fishermen. Think what it's like being a fish in the wild. You might see a nice juicy worm, but you never know whether there's a hook in it or not. Because in your experience of swimming in the lakes and the rivers, sometimes you see some of your friends, your fellow fish, maybe your brothers and sisters, gulp down a nice juicy worm and suddenly get pulled upwards and disappear from your life forever. Oh, it's so dangerous being a fish. You never know what you can eat and what you can't eat. In fact, it's so dangerous that fish have got anxiety complexes about food. <laughs> And they never know what they can eat, what they can't eat, what's dangerous and what... That's why many fish are anorexic. <laughs> it's true, you know, because they're psychotic these days. They see, eating is brought with so much danger these days. There's so many people fishing these days that they don't know what, what food is safe or isn't. But a fish in a tank, they can eat without any fear. Imagine going to a restaurant. You don't know whether it's going to be your last meal or not. <laughs> Would you be able to enjoy your food? No, you get indigestion at the very least. So, <laughs> fish in a tank are free from indigestion. They can eat very easily. That's the first freedom. They're free from the danger of fishermen. Number two, have you ever seen an owner of a fish tank put fish in the same tank who eat each other? They never put cannibal fish in the same tank. But out in the wild, it's very dangerous. It's not just the danger from fishermen, it's the danger from bigger fish who can eat you. And you know these days, that it's getting so bad in the rivers and lakes that some fish don't feel safe, you know, swimming up some dark creeks at night. <laughs> it's so dangerous because there's big fish lurking there. So, in a tank, in an aquarium, that's the second freedom. You're...